Thanks, everyone, uh, for letting me be here and kicking off this um, artificial intelligence and data science track. Uh, my name is Dor Kedem, and I have a great story to tell you about uh, model industrialization and ING. Uh, right off the bat, I will tell you I'm not going to waste your time at all. Um, I'm going to have quite a lot of references in my slides that you can later follow up and uh, take on to your uh, organization and implement that. And uh, I'm trying to give you some insights, both technical and business-wise, about how can you uh, do the transformation that we have done in ING. Um, and I'm very much looking forward also to hearing from your experiences on how did you manage to apply data science in your organization, and maybe we can have that chat a bit later. Also, if you want, grab me later to discuss any of these topics, uh, data science or non-data science related, I'll be very happy to, to engage. Um, so a little bit about myself. I was uh, in the last five years in ING in different various roles. Um, in my latest role, I am a lead data scientist and a product owner for the product that I'm uh, showing you right now. For those of you who don't know ING, ING is uh, one of the largest banks in Europe. Uh, we're active in more than 40 countries. We have over 38 million customers and over 50,000 employees. It's quite a, a large-scale bank, but we also really strive for uh, customer satisfaction, and we are uh, the leading bank in uh, six European countries. Um, usually when I tell people about me working in a bank, it's, it might be a bit surprising, but banking environment is very uh, terminal and exciting for, for a data scientist. Um, and I've listed out a couple of... Uh, three of these main uh, challenges with regards to data science. Uh, the first one is, um, well, if you've been aware of the banking scene in the last decade or so, you know that since the financial crisis, we're in an all-time uh, interest rate low. And this directly affects the revenue streams of banks. Banks who used to rely on lending, all of a sudden now have to find out uh, if they can find new business models. Uh, the second thing is about, uh, bless you, the second thing is about uh, regulation. Um, I'm quite sure all of you are aware of, of GDPR, but by a show of hands, who knows of uh, PSD2? Okay, that's quite an audience. How many of you, stay, stay, keep your hands, how many of you are bankers? Okay, so there is quite an overlap there. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, PSD2 in two words is open banking. So if up until now your bank had all of your uh, transaction data and customer engagement that you've had with your uh, bank. And whenever you needed services, you would go to the bank application or the bank branch. Um, starting maybe this year or next year for sure, um, banks will have to provide that service to any third party that you as the customer empowered to do so. So that means if there is an app from Google from Apple or from any one of these uh, lovely fintech industries that you see on, on, on your left, um, on my left, then you can, uh, they can take that segment of that bank functionality, be it payment, be it uh, transaction categorization, um, any one of those uh, profitable areas that the banks use to engage with you as a customer and just take it out of the bank and banks don't have much to do with this. So how does a bank uh, differentiate or, or even thrive in this kind of, of environment? So at ING, we really try to focus on our customers and really try to see how can we offer services to help them stay ahead in life and in business. But if you look into our uh, strategic priorities and how do we drive that change, how do we create this differentiating experience, you will see three main elements, uh, analytics, innovation, and uh, new business models. And I would argue that data science is at the heart of each of those three, three core elements, as the fuel and as the, um, the compass. So a little bit about analytics efforts in ING. So we have two types of analytics effort. The third one is about transforming the entire organization. So we are trying, I told you before, we have over 50,000 employees. We're trying to transform all of these employees to speak in a data um, language. We have business translator courses, uh, we have different uh, transitions, we try to involve them in, in big data projects to really help them see the potential of big data so new ideas will stem from them. At the same time, 
we have uh, focused data science teams who are working on key uh, key elements for the uh, for the bank and its objectives and i will focus on customer interaction for this uh, this talk but feel free to grab me also later for for others so i am a member of a group called one to one analytics and um, one-to-one -one analytics is a little bit like a consultancy firm within the bank. So we send uh, our uh, employees all throughout the, div the different business units in the bank, and we try to help them become more data-driven. Um, it is our effort to make sure that the data within IMZ is utilized the best and proper way uh, all across uh, the bank, as you can see right here, to the benefit of our customers. Um, within our uh, group, uh, I, I try to simplify the different roles that we have to something that I hope can, can communicate to all of you guys as well. So we are mainly composed of uh, data analysts who have some uh, BI skills and SQL techniques. Uh, we have a group of data scientists and uh, who are building uh, data models and different data products that react on customers. And we have data engineers who are mainly focusing on model hosting, ETL processes, all of these um, good stuff with leveraging on top of the data that you have. All of these functions, they also engage with customer journey experts who are basically our um, business users. They are the ones who create the different products in the bank. They are the ones who know our customers. They're the ones who create those messages on how do we engage with, with our customers. Just by show of hands, uh, how many of you see yourself in one of those rubrics or managing one of those rubrics? Okay, I think the most of you. So um, I hope that we, uh, when I describe the need, you'll be able to relate to these uh, challenges as well. And let's get to it. Um, so here's a real case um, that we engage with analytics. So. Uh, one of the products that INZ offers is, of course, a credit card. And toward uh, Black Friday, one of the things that a customer journey expert uh, wants to do is to contact customers who might be interested in a credit card offering. We have two types of credit cards, one regular and a platinum. And um, well, the, the customer journey expert created the message. Um, they have an idea of what it is they want to, to contact. But they're not really sure on who to contact. So they have two options today. They can either go to a data analyst and ask them, can you do some reportings on who are the people that have purchased the product in the last uh, six months? How do they change demographically? Um, and maybe we can contact some other people that are like that under the, the GDPR umbrella. Um, well, the other alternative is for them to contact the data scientist to ask them to come up with a model that can rank customers right, between most likely to least likely to, uh, to be interested in such an offering and to eventually acquire such a, such a product. I have to say that I think over 90% uh, or the vast majority of cases goes to that one. Goes, uh, they go to the data analyst. And there are many reasons behind that. I mean, you can think about it that data analysts, they mainly sit closer together with the business, while data scientists are much scarcer and they're working together as a group. Um, there's a lot of uh, back and forth engagement between the, the customer journey experts and data analysts. Um, and they feel like they understand the customer better and they feel like using this data analyst, they, they get to, to empower themselves too. Um, but there are some disadvantages going that way. So th the biggest disadvantage is that you are not really leveraging on top of the, the wonderful work that models are doing all across the, the world, right? You're, you're not really leveraging on top of your, all of your data. So if you have um, features that are specific toward the customer, you can't really be personal in this kind of approach. You have to look at your customers as a, as a general population. Um, you're becoming uh, wasteful with regards to the work of data analysts. There's a lot of work both trying to tailor, to fine tune and to make sure that you are uh, selecting the right customers. And when you are not meeting your objectives, you have to do this manual selection again. Um, and we can do much better. We can do much, much better with models. So in theory, this is where I would start my talk and I would say, this is how we productionalize my models in INZ. Um, but when you are making a, a transformation in your organization, there is another thing that you need to, uh, to think about, and that 
how does uh, incorporating models in your day-to-day -day process affects your, um, your employees who are supposed to leverage and use on, uh, those models? And uh, I want to give an example from um, a pro similar project that we've had maybe four or five years ago about an NBA action, um, engine. So NBA is the next best action. These different uh, text messages that you sometimes see the, uh, when you log into the website, uh, these are personalized to you. Um, and we have created an engine that tries to find out what is the best message to uh, present to a customer. And uh, I can tell you that both the data analysts and the customer journey experts, they really hated it. They felt like they don't understand sometimes why does a message uh, presented to a certain customer. They felt like they don't have control on who gets to see their message. Um, they felt like they are powerless. You know, all of their information and knowledge that they have gained on top of our customers, that all of a sudden a data scientist tells me I don't need it anymore. And, and that's something that you really need to think about when implementing such a solution in, in your organization, that this fear of automation or this fear of I'm empowered by the work that I do and by the knowledge that I have is something that is real. And you really have to address that. Uh, the way that we address that is that um, we focused on empowerment rather than revolution. Sure, you know, we, we have in our horizon something that is orchestrated very significantly and taking into account all the different model results from everywhere and, and coming up with you know, like some holy grail. Um, but this is not how you build, let's say, agile prog uh, projects. What you really want to do is to see how can you empower the day-to-day -day work from, of data analysts and customer journey experts and making them efficient on a personal level. Something that you want to win over your customer. And in our customer case, our customer is the, the business user. Uh, I'm also referencing here a methodology that really helped us um, achieve that. It's something that we developed in INZ that is a combination of both agile and design thinking. And it really helps us focus and validate hypotheses in a very uh, rapid manner. Uh, do feel to check it out. Feel free to check it out. So our approach. Um, a model factory. And what do we mean by a model factory? So we wanted to get to the point where we give a data analyst who, by, a, you know, by definition, as we defined before, you know, they, they understand the data, they understand how to write SQL statements, right? But they don't necessarily know how to develop uh, in Python or uh, to create some, some techniques to be able to uh, create models uh, but not just create any models. You know, like you can, uh, there are all these tools like uh, Data Robot that you can drag and drop and, and see, uh, see a model. But uh, to really do this in a way that is feasible for a bank, so that means GDPR, archiving, legal, uh, commercial pressure, all of these um, umbrella of features taken into account, and uh, something that empowers them in their work. So they will tell us what uh, they want. We will take care of on the how, and we will uh, take them hand by hand through this process. So we want eventually that data analyst who uses this tool will be able to communicate with his customer journey experts the same way that they're able to do with their own BI tools today. And this is where we sort of uh, came up with the design. And uh, I'm also referencing here several uh, similar open source approaches if you want to take on and, and restart something yourself as well. So the idea is that um, we have some sort of a recipe on how do we want to, to build a model, and I'll detail it in a second. Uh, that recipe goes into some sort of a model building process. Uh, this model building process is uh, leveraged on top of existing building blocks that different data scientists and uh, data engineers can contribute to, uh, to the benefit of all the different users in the model industrialization. And eventually, there comes out with a scoring function, so something that, given a customer and the problem that I had in the model recipe, what I how likely is that customer to answer my question? So if it's a credit card acquisition, how likely is my customer going to acquire that, um, that credit card? We have uh, some quality assurance on top of all of these, and we connect uh, to the rest of our INZ systems um, to be able to really make that, uh, that impact, that business impact. 
and to communicate with the rest of the um, data analysts across uh, what exactly did the model perform. So I will try to go through, I think, the, the vast majority of these rubrics and give you some examples on what are the things that we took into account and also maybe hear from you guys on what do you think um, is interesting to take into account in each of those. So just to, to start with the model recipe. So um, the model recipe is basically something that is specific to your business. And this is something that is related to your business objective. So in our case in banking, we have several products that we want to either acquire, um, intensify the usage of those to, to retain customers that already have that product, uh, or to uh, empower a customer in the customer journey. So make sure that a customer gets to a landing page that eventually helps them in their uh, business activities. Um, all of this is something that is very, uh, that we've designed in a way that is very simple to, uh, to specify for a data analyst. In addition to uh, other t two other things that are very crucial for uh, the expertise of customer journey experts and data analysts, which is indicating which customers they want to exclude or include. So who are the customers that are even eligible for those offerings? And which features do they want to include or exclude? And this is something that, uh, where uh, we there is a process here uh, between us and the data engineers and uh, data analysts and customer journey experts where we try to make them rely more and more on the models. So that means we want them to select as wide a variety of customers as possible, only keep tr uh, the customers that are eligible for the product, even if they think they're, they're not necessarily relevant. Um, as the same thing with the features. So there's a little bit of a, um, of a delicate dance, right? Like they feel like they want to incorporate as much of their knowledge as possible. Uh, we want for them to, um, to expand and let the model figure out things um, themselves. And this is something that we kind of felt uh, gives them the ability to both uh, leverage and control. So we sort of start usually with a wide selection. And then if they find out that uh, some features are um, uh, without a better term, let's say overfitting. So, um, if you already, if you're getting a ING um, customer package, you might also get a platinum credit card. So, have, getting that package is not really an indicative, and that's something that is very easy to communicate with with data analysts. Um, and then they can r remove that feature and rerun that that model. All in all. Um, this entire model specification is roughly 10 to 15 lines of, uh, of JSON and something that for a data analyst is very clear uh, to, to read because it's, it's just about their business and also for customer journey experts. Uh, I think this is one of two important slides. Um, and this is really about trying to understand what the building blocks are uh, composed of. And we will go into um, each of those specific, some of these uh, specific uh, building blocks, we have a time limit, um, to really give you guys also um, um, some of the best practices that, that we've developed and um, something to think about later uh, when you come and implement it on your organization. But do think about you know, like, uh, how do you extract features, classifiers, evaluators, but also issues of uh, hyperparameter tuning or fairness. Um, we will dive into those right now. So um, the first one is about uh, data sources. So I think I, I heard Andrew Ng's uh, talk, I think about five years ago, in the, when he was saying what's the first thing that an organization needs to do before they, they implement analytics, he said, you know, build a unified data warehouse. This is our um, schema of, let's say, a unified uh, data warehouse. So we have different uh, INZ systems that create, um, uh, let's say, dumps of files uh, alongside with a streaming data platform that uh, register events. And all of these informations, uh, they go into a data lake uh, powered by, uh, by IBM here. Uh, the data engineers are the ones that's really in charge of these ETL processes and making sure that um, from those uh, different data dumps to the data lakes and onto the data structure, uh, structured data sources, um, this entire uh, pipeline is uh, valid and 
and processed. Uh, from there on, uh, we have, bless you, we have uh, data scientists and data engineers who really take on uh, these uh, structured data sources and extract some uh, interesting features from those. Um, it could be about the product ownership, it could be about um, uh, customer engagement on, on the website, um, engaging with the call center. Um, it could be some demographics about, about the customer within, um, within legislation. And this is something that is um, not only useful for our uh, modeling, but also later useful for their uh, data analysis. So they later take these uh, sources and build reports that it makes it easier for them to, um, to explain to customer journey experts what it is that they see. Um, but this is, all of this is under the, um, the IBM um, environment, and because this is a m really a data engineering uh, conference, I'm very happy to go even deeper dive into how do we transform this information to an environment that data scientists can, can start working on. Uh, so we really leverage on top of uh, the, the HDP, and uh, we use the scooping process to um, periodically take that information that is extracted from all of these data sources and move them to, uh, to our Hadoop environment, where we will later also um, using Spark to, to really train those models. Um, on top of these uh, uh, Hadoop data sources, we also uh, employ Ranger policies, uh, both on the, uh, on the HDFS level and on the, the Hive level, so on the specific metadata. So uh, all of the uh, access management, uh, especially because we are right now um, two countries, both the Dutch and the Belgian Bank are going to go to a place where they have uh, one uh, technical infrastructure behind them, and there are different uh, legislation that involve them. Uh, so we really may utilize that uh, framework to make sure that uh, there is a level of data segregation and isolation between uh, users. Um, so once we have the data in the, uh, on our environment, we can start uh, talking a little bit about uh, data science. Th just by show of hand, how many of you are considering themselves as data scientists? Just so I can, okay, uh, there is a relevant uh, segment over here especially to that side. Um, so uh, one of the things that uh, you do usually before you start building the uh, models is about creating data sets. And usually one of the, um, one of the key cornerstones that uh, you do is you kind of take like a cross-validation, so something that really helps you fine-tune your, your parameters. Um, now, if because most of our problems today are prediction problems, uh, there are different ways to make those uh, specification of cross-validations better, or something that helps you generalize in a better way. Uh, this thing doesn't actually come, uh, let's say, out of the box with, uh, with the Spark packages, um, but there is a, a really good reference here about how do you create cross-validation uh, functions in PySpark. Uh, you basically over uh, recreate that that same uh, class and add some logic for yourself. Uh, what we've done is we have added uh, several of these building blocks, several of these uh, cross validator uh, ways. Um, this is one of them on time series. We have a stratified one. We just have like a random uh, k-folds specification um, that in that model recipe, basically based on uh, this one line that says uh, which, um, which cross-validator are you going to use, uh, you can already leverage and, and utilize that. And this is, um, I, I want to say that it's really important to make sure that these things are also set in default. Like you can't expect your data analyst or customer journey experts to, uh, to fill this, but at the same time you want to give uh, flexibility to to data scientists to improve models if they, if they can. Uh, the, the next element that I want to talk about is about preparing data. So we talked about how do you split the, um, the training and test set, for example. Um, this is about, uh, we really leverage on top of the PySpark um, uh, feature library, ML feature libraries. And they have quite a lot of really, really interesting um, uh, transformers, um, uh, quantizer, uh, 
uh, buckets, uh, string indexers. Uh, if you are not user, uh, familiar with the PySpark ML, uh, feel free to, to check out that library. It, it's really, really helpful when you're doing um, big data processing. And eventually, we get to a point where our entire, um, our entire data transformation is inside what's called a pipeline model. And that's really cool because this is something that we can later serialize. Uh, and I'm sorry if I'm going a bit too technical, but uh, feel free to stop me or to ask me for more technical details later. Um, with regards to uh, one more bonus uh, slides with regards to filling missing values, we also, uh, other than using the imputer class for uh, filling in missing value, we also use a machine learning technique called um, autoencoders. And the idea is that you're building a model that tries to, it's a little bit like zipping, if you're, um, you're familiar. So you take uh, your data, you try to get a lower dimension representation of that, and then you're trying to reconstruct the, your data. And what's really cool about that is that you are able to use that to fill in uh, data that you might have missing. Um, by taking the records with the missing data, feeding it into the autoencoder, and getting back the, the result. Uh, if you want, uh, this is uh, leverage on top of deep learning or neural networks. And if you want to do deep learning on top of Spark, check out this uh, Kern um, library about distributed Keras, uh, which makes it really simple to, uh, to build such things. Speaking of model building, so as I was saying throughout the talk, we're using Spark um, as a machine learning uh, framework where you can test out different types of, of learning techniques, and several of those are tested automatically. We're also uh, currently experimenting with uh, what's called AutoML. So this is giving your data set uh, and a wide variety of transformers. How can you find the best transformer? Um, so feel free to, to check this out. And the last uh, building block that I want to, to refer to is, is fairness. Um, so up until now, we were talking on um, mainly you know, campaigning, right? Like uh, you want to get to customers that uh, will want to buy credit cards, so you want to uh, offer them a message, like you know, a phone call, an email, a, a recommended uh, message on the website. Um, this is all fine and good, but well, models can be used also for uh, some other core businesses. So one of the requirements that I got uh, from this uh, tool was, can we create a model that, let's say, prioritize customers on who gets an invitation for a mortgage meeting, as opposed to just having a phone, uh, phone conversation? And you don't want your models to, let's say, prioritize only the married couple who work in the iTech industries, necessarily. I mean, you, you want to make sure that uh, the level of service that you as a bank provide to your customer is, you know, even though there, there are risk elements and we are trying to, uh, to eventually you know, sell mortgages, you want to make sure that it's representative of your population and that everyone has a chance of, of getting the service that, that you're offering. Um, so this is, um, this is a really important element of the discussion. I would, I would refer to you uh, to Google, who has a very clear explanation on, on how um, how to attack discrimination with uh, machine learning. Some really cool and clear definitions. Feel free to check it out. And um, when you want to actually try to address those problems and mitigate those, also feel free to look at uh, IBM uh, AI Fairness 360. Really simple uh, approaches and really e easy stuff that you can also implement yourself. And we've, we've implemented some of those in, in uh, Spark as well, in PySpark as well. So. Uh, these are the building blocks that are leveraging us to really create, eventually, from the model specification, a scoring function. Right? But, but what do we do with this uh, scoring function? How do we communicate how, how good is our uh, model? So we try to really list out the, these different um, use cases on, on who are the people that need to know and what is it that they need to know. So we really try to, to figure out you know, that uh, what, uh, what do data engineers need to know? What do data scientists need to know when they're creating such models? Uh, what do customer journey experts care about? Um, so we, we've created this mapping, uh, and we've cr uh, set two different tools to address those, uh, two of those questions. 
So for the customer journey experts and data analysts, we mainly use the, the BI system that they have been using up until now. Uh, while for the machine learning uh, lifetime tool, we were using our uh, in-house developed uh, monitoring tool. Um, our in-house developed monitoring tool is mainly built on top of um, uh, Python and PySpark, where the, the visualization is on top of uh, uh, D3.js and Elasticsearch. You will see some, some slides there. And uh, the idea is that whenever we create a new model, we push our information to, to the log stash, and then we're able to, um, to see that in our uh, front end on top of uh, Elasticsearch. I want to show you a couple of, um, of examples on how does it look like. And um, so we have our, how does it look like, like this. So we have, for example, a list of projects uh, where we can see also, like, is this project OK, or is the, uh, are there some metrics that we want to look into? And then we can uh, deep dive into different questions, like um, which how, uh, how the different metrics that you record on top of models uh, perform over time. Uh, how does your data distribution varies over time, as opposed to when you train the model? How does your, the predictions distribution that you generate uh, deviate over time. What were the technical stages and, and logs that you have uh, created? And, and can you see, spot any errors in execution? Um, there is a really good resource, um, at least that I found really useful, um, by, by Google AI. Uh, it was uh, published in a workshop at NIPS in 2016 on what is your uh, ML test score? So how can you really... Um, uh, what are the tests that Google AI are doing before they're deploying models into to production? And uh, this is a really cool resource if you guys want to, to really evaluate your uh, monitoring processes. And also check out the MLflow uh, that actually came out slightly after when we already had that. Um, and the second point is like we were talking about, is about reporting uh, on, on the model and, and the BI solutions that, uh, that we have. And um, it, it's really important because th there are, eventually, this, i this is our um, acceptance uh, phase. So this is where a data, sign a data analyst or a customer journey experts look into our results and says, uh, do I want to use this? Do I not want to use this? What does it tell me about my customers? And who am I going to select? Um, and we have also mapped for each of those different roles what kind of uh, um, what kind of visualization helps for each stage. I'll just go through them briefly so we can um, understand them. So I think uh, this is a slide that many data scientists have seen before, at least the, the left one on uh, cumulative gains. So basically that's how many, uh, if you are ranking your customers based on the model from most uh, likely to least likely, uh, if you take, let's say, the top, uh, the top 10%, right? How many of your uh, total conversions did you grab, right? Did you catch with that uh, selection? Uh, another uh, alternative that uh, it's basically the same graph, but uh, a little bit uh, of reverse. This is just the, uh, the orange graph divided by the green graph, and that's what you see over here, is what's called the lift curve. So this is how much better do we do than random selection? So if we take the top 10%, for example, then we are about 4.5 times better in targeting customers when you would do at random. And this is cool, um, but they also want to know, well, I've had a personal selection before, how does it compare to it? And that's where this, uh, this graph comes, uh, comes about. So what you see here in orange is, about, is their old selection. What we see in blue is uh, customers that weren't selected, and again, uh, arranged from uh, most uh, relevant to least relevant. And what's really cool about this slide, this kind of graph, is that it enables data uh, customer journey experts and data analysts to feel like, okay, the model is is thinking a little bit like me. Like I'm I'm also uh, targeting these these type of customers, but there are some that I didn't really uh, capture in based on my selection. And how do I get them? Right. So that's why we have this kind of slide over there, so we can kind of help them to understand how do based on different features. How does their select, uh, past selection deviates from the one that the model selected? And how does, in general, the population, the interesting population looks like as opposed to uh, the population that the model doesn't think are interesting? 
Um, uh, sorry about the obfuscation of the features, uh, but I, I do have to say that feature importance is a really important one. Uh, so something that goes through each of those features and help the customer journey experts and data scientists figure out what exactly does the model do, even if the model is nonlinear. Um, and it really helps when you also compare different models. Like for example, in, in, these, uh, in these cases, you have similar models. So you can see that some features are similar to each other. For example, how many um, purchases does a customer have is a strong indicator for uh, whether they'll be interested in the credit card. But there are some features that are specific to, um, let's say, regular credit card or to platinum credit card. So, and it's not something that you would immediately think of. Like, for example, with platinum credit card, one of the things that we found out was um, the level of transactions in foreign currency. And this is not something that, you know, like uh, a customer journey experts will immediately think about. Uh, that, you know, like foreign currency, for us, it makes sense now that we kind of think about and trying to rationalize it. But it's not always uh, clear. Uh, even if you know about this, how do you uh, use a rule-based to, to answer that kind of question? Um, from there we go into customer segmentation, which answers the question on who are my really, really, really important customers and how do I frame a message to them? So up until now we showed you that you can kind of uh, rank customers from most likely to least likely. Here we can also show how do we target customers based on segments. So basically saying, well, these and these are the interesting segments for you, and we can uh, derive from them different, um, different analyses that will help you tune your message uh, properly. Uh, another interesting one is uh, about comparing different models, is about trying to understand which customer is more interested in one product than another. And what you see here is basically, again, the, the ranking is from more interested to least interested for the regular credit card, and most interested to least interested in the platinum. What you see is that we have you know, like a big group of customers who are not interested in credit cards at all. Uh, but for those who are interested, you know, there are some that, are, uh, that prefer one product more than another. And this is a really cool um, motivation for customer journey experts to really uh, make different messages for different uh, customers. And finally, the, uh, the final question that they basically ask us is, how much conv uh, convergence can I expect? And this is something that uh, your model needs to translate to them as well. So if you take, let's say, the top 10%, then this is you know, like an expected convergence. Um, so to wrap up, and maybe to open the question if you guys have any, um, this entire process is really driven to, to make sure that we are empowering our existing users. Sure, we want to, uh, to utilize models all across the board, um, but at the same time, um, we, we don't want to take away the, the per personal element and the individual element in that process as well. We want to really make sure that um, we are empowering uh, customers and experts, accelerate data analysts in that process, and eventually helping all of us become more relevant to our customers. And uh, with that, uh, thank you very much. And if you have any questions, I'm very happy to answer. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. So how do you secure um, the strength? I'm sorry, can you, can you go to the mic? It's hard for me to, to hear. Yeah. Hi. Uh, how do you um, secure that when in that you don't expose sensitive data like PII data to the data scientists? Well, that's a great question. So um, the, I think I showed it in one of the slides on top, uh, this one. So this analytic uh, uh, base table, so we are already filtering out based on uh, GDPR features. We're meeting with legal as well to make sure that the, the usage of the, uh, those models are uh, GDPR compliant and within the acceptance uh, of our customer, within the expectations of our customers. Um, and I'm trying to think if the, there's any other thing that we do. So this entire process is also managed, like I said, with, with our own um, what's called um, business roles. So something that if you are a certain business person, then you are allowed to see a certain type of, of segment in the data. And this is managed on top of, of Ranger uh, as well.
So I hope that answers the, the question. Anything else? Yeah, go ahead. What was the strategy to set these data sources? What was the strategy to set these uh, data sources? It's interesting because we right now have the same uh, process as well. So we are joining the uh, data scientists and the, sorry, the Belgium and the NL data source to one data source. So it's, it's a really relevant question. What we do right now is uh, we take on different segments. So there are different business groups, like let's say mortgages, right? And we start with them and we make sure that uh, we have a complete solution to, uh, to this uh, segment. And then we're able to kind of uh, build this in an agile manner. You know, start from, from one team, go to the next, go to the next, go to the next. And eventually this uh, analytic uh, table, analytics feature table, is the aggregate of uh, these different insights from these different data sources. But uh, you want to make sure that you have a business expert who validates the, the data that you are generating at every different stage. So business, by, business unit by business unit, that's, that's the short answer. Yeah. Um, uh, my question would be how many analysis models you have in production and how do you manage them to retrain them, to refresh them? Do you have some perspective on that? Yeah, uh, great question about uh, how many models do we have and uh, how do we retrain and, and uh, manage them. So uh, in this new approach, like this right now, we have 10. We also had 30 other models that we have built in similar fashion, but not with this new uh, infrastructure. So th these outputs are generated, but not with this, let's say, fancy uh, model recipe. Um, the way that we manage them right now with regards to retraining, that's a really interesting question because we are disputed on this. So in Belgium, uh, for the most part, they, uh, the data analysts, they were the ones who build the model, and they want to make sure that you know, the lift levels are, are uh, stay the way that they are. And, and they, they're the ones that pick the features. So if the lift falls, they don't want it to retrain. They want to, to re-evaluate and re recreate it themselves. While in the Netherlands, um, we have retraining on a more uh, structured manner. So be it schedule or also once the lift has fallen, let's say, at, at 10%. Um, so it's a little bit of a difference of approach. And I think you know, the, the answer is, what, will, what works for your business, right? Uh, you do need to have a metrics to make sure that your model is still in good quality, right? But you also want to make sure that your users eventually feel comfortable in using this. And if you every time you know flip the models from underneath their feet, that doesn't necessarily uh, translate trust. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, great question. So um, there are two ways of kind of improving uh, model um, model performance. One is with the model recipe. So uh, I think that I saw it right here. That other than the uh, the different business objectives, there are also other ingredients that we've set defaults for. So you know, what is the uh, the models that you? What are the classifiers that you are trying to to tune? What is the uh, the grid search uh, uh, that you're looking for. Um, so based on these elements, you can kind of play around with. Also, uh, how big is your train set, uh, test set? And the second thing is, you know, you try to leverage on top of these um, uh, meta-learning approaches, like uh, AutoML, something that you can really uh, feed it and tell him, OK, now you have four hours. Try to explore the different feature uh, the parameter space as much as possible. Uh, they're optimizing for you know different Bayesian selection on on these hyperparameters, and uh, they're they're doing quite a good job actually. Uh, but but honestly, the, the usually the questions you get is not how do I get from 4.5 times lift at 10 percent to five percent uh, five times uh, lift at 10 percent. Usually the questions you get is so how can I take the information that model that you've given me and generate business value from it. And that's why it's important for us also to work in small cycles so we don't kind of stay in our silo and, and just build a, an optimal model that doesn't necessarily generate value. 
Yeah, uh, so grab me up uh, afterwards. Thank you so much.